Hi and welcome to the first Intergeo podcast of 2022. And we are convinced that in line with Intergeo's motto, inspiration for a smarter world, this is exactly what the global geo community has been waiting for. Inspiration and smart knowledge from this podcast. And as the topics of digital twins and BIM in the construction industry will play a central role at the by now 28th Intergeo this October in Essen, we will start, of course, with this topic and a woman who, and I hereby take the opportunity to say this, is for me, my Dr. Bim. She is the one and only Ilka Mai from Locklev Consulting. Hello, Ilka. Hello and welcome. Nice to have you here. How are you? Hello, Jenny. Thank you. I'm very well. Thank you for that very warm welcome. Yeah, yeah. I know you for several years and we're always talking about the context of BIM and also the digital twins. And for me, you're my Dr. BIM. You are. (laughs) So um, our topic today is data is more like soil, not like oil. So you inspired us to this um, headline today and how the added value of the digital twin grows through sharing. And when it comes to digital twins, your name comes up in this context. For many, many years, you have been a guest and expert at Intergeo as a speaker, a panel participant, but also as a solution provider in the context of the application and creation of digital twins. So many will know you in this context of BIM, Smart City and Digital Twins. And for those who don't, the following brief introduction may help. You hold a doctorate in geography. In 2015, you were in charge of the development of the step-by-step plan, also dem Stufenplan, digital planning and building on behalf of the, of the Ministry of Transport and Digital Infrastructure. And since 2018, you are playing a key role in accompanying the update of Deutsche Bahn's BIM strategy. You are CEO of the company LockLab Consulting and specialized in creating 3D digital twins and bringing them into use. So, Ilka, let's start. We have a little warm up. So, please answer the next three questions in one sentence or less. Is that okay? It's okay, Denise. But can we just say one thing before we start? That's okay. Because you talk about digital twins, and now you just mentioned 3D digital twin, and we all have probably some sort of understanding what we mean by that. But yours, Denise, might be completely different to my. Uh, imagination of a digital twin. So some people see that as a point cloud or a 3D mesh. Other people think um, it's only alphanumeric data. And my understanding also now when in our conversation, when I talk about a digital twin, I always mean a 3D model. So that's different to other people. But also I mean um, an object-based um, 3D model so that has a proper data structure in the background. So that's just something I wanted to um, clarify before we start and warm up. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So let's start with the first question in our warm up. So on a scale of one, extremely unlikely to 10, with absolute certainty, how likely is that that you will make it into the history box as a digital twin pioneer or Mrs. Bim? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Likelihood, but for me personally, um, as a person, I think not very likely, so zero to one maybe. But when we talk about Lock Lab and what we do, I would hope that uh, it's a 10. Okay, perfect. So with your company, yes, I say with you as a person too, <laughs> you will. So second question, what are your core skills in relation to digital twins? What's your strength? My strength, um, well, from the feedback um, that I got from other people, uh, it is being able to explain the added value, but also the relationships between digital twins and, for example, BIM um, in a comprehensible and understandable way. Okay, third question. What fascinates you about digital twins? How beautiful they are. 
Have you looked at one? They are stunning. But that's not the only thing. I think it is really the the, the added value and also the, the wide variety of use cases that you can think of. And it never seems to end. There's always something else that someone thinks of um, that they can also be used for and, and add value all the time. Thank you very much for the warm up. So let's go now a little bit deeper because um, you see the enormous potential for improvement uh, in the 3D twins and that pushes you. So now let's get into the detail. In the pre-talk with my colleague Monica, you inspired her to this uh, title, uh, to this headline of today's podcast. Data is more like soil and not like oil. So what do you mean by that? Okay, first of all, I can't take credit for this uh, quote. Uh, it's not from me, uh, but I think it is spot on. Um, and I heard it and learned it um, when I did my um, Smart City professional education program at uh, Imperial College London from Professor Gu. And that inspired me too. So what does it mean? Um, what do we associate with oil? Well, a lot of people and organizations rely on it. Um, and there's a lot of money to be made from it. Yeah. And that's also true of data. So you could say, and some people do, um, data is like oil. However, oil, as we know, is a finite resource. The more people use oil, the faster it runs out. Data is just the opposite. It keeps growing. So the more people share their data, the greater is the potential and also is the value that we all get from the data. So that makes it more like soil. One example for that. So for example, I love Google Maps. So when I plan a trip, I no longer listen to the uh, traffic radio that's only every 30 minutes to know if there is a traffic jam and how long it will take me to get somewhere. So what I, what I do is I take Google Maps and I just open it and click on the traffic and then I, I see it exactly. So Google knows, um, well, Google knows how many mobile phones are, where they are and how fast they go along. And that's how they can calculate if there's a traffic jam and how long it will take me to get there on this road. So if only one person would share that information, I'd say 100 people would share that information, it wouldn't work. It would be a very, very limited value. But because it's millions of people sharing the location of their mobile phones, we can have services on the basis of that, which are really, really valuable. Mm. Thanks for that example. I love that and that the value of data grows when it's used. So that makes sense. Um, but all too often when we talk about data, we talk about silo structures, the isolated availability of data detached from other departments or company processes. So, um, but core of the digital twins lies in thinking processes together, um, doesn't it? So. Maybe is the human being an obstacle in the success story of the digital twins? Mm, that makes it too simple. I think uh, it's not just humans holding us back there. So if you think of an organization, so every organization has to set up and manage itself according to its target operating model, let's say, or its purpose. And we can think of that like um, like a pyramid. Top of the pyramid is the strategy. So the strategy sets out, or the vision sets out, how the organization will reach its its uh, aims and its and meet the target operating model. And below the the, the top and the the strategy as the next uh, horizontal layer is uh, sits the governance. So the governance is um, where the framework condition. Um, is set out for the implementation of the strategy. And below the governance are the processes, because the processes are is what we need to comply with the guidelines or the governance to implement the strategy. Below the processes, the next layer down is the technology, because we all need tools, maybe software, we need data. So we need something um, that helps us to work and live the processes that implement the framework and uh, the strategy. And at the bottom of the pyramid, where it's widest, um, that's where the people are. So people need to use the software and the data and use the processes, etc., etc. So it's all linked together. So these are the horizontals of the pyramid. 
Then we have the verticals. The verticals could be different business units, for example, and they all have their own targets. And that's the silos you're talking about. So very often in the, in the verticals, we have responsibilities, budgets, risks, business risks, etc. So the idea now is the stronger the horizontal layers are, the more freedom you can give to the business units to act within their own silos. However, when you now think about digitization that comes along and changes everything, it doesn't change just that one layer of technology, so software and data. It has to change the processes. We need to think about the governance. And we need to think about, for example, data security, data protection. So all of that needs to change. Then we need to change when we change the tools. We need to train people. We need to re-educate people. And we need to communicate the change, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is quite complicated, and it takes a long time, especially for a big organization um, with lots of systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So just saying that it's the people holding us back. That wouldn't be fair because there's a lot of change to be done, and all needs to come together. And I think this is the problem. Okay, thank you very much for that explanation. And we see how many different layer, layers it has to come to that change process of a digital twin way of thinking in, in companies and associations and so on. So um, let's have a look at um, digital twins with um, kind of artificial intelligence in them, superior to uh, human uh, decision-making um so um, are, are they superior when artificial intelligence is them or is that just um, um, kind of science fiction? Um, okay, well, um, so I think when it comes to um, like lightning fast analysis of numbers of facts as a basis for a decision, then obviously, yes, um, Systems, computers, digital twins, whatever, uh, probably are superior. <laughs> they are. Um, but decision making, especially human decision making, is much more than just that, um, which very quickly uh, leads us into uh, an ethical debate, doesn't it? Okay. Do you have an example for that? Um, yeah. Um, so one example that's quite uh, widely discussed when you think of autonomous driving, and again there you can think of lots of digital twins. So there is a digital twin of the road network, for example, and then there's a car, um, and you need to train the car um, to be able to drive autonomously. Um, however, when you put that into the real world, um, and then let's say there is um, uh, a conflict, so uh, the car detect or sensors detect that there's a collision is inevitable will happen and then you've got just one choice to the left and there's maybe a person with a baby push chair and on the right there's a person elderly person with a walking stick where does the car go decision to be made hmm. the car can calculate and can make a decision okay how can we cope with that as people as humans to make that decision Okay. Ilka, um, with LockLab, you create digital twins. And um, yeah, you, can you give examp an example um, of why digital twins are more like soil and less like oil, um, as this quote suggests? Um, yeah, we can. So um, our digital twins, they are data integrators. You can think of them as really as a data integrator. Um, so as I said at the beginning, and this is why I made the point, they always have a structure, a data structure. So they always contain objects. And that object structure um, enables them, uh, enables the clients or whoever to connect um, the digital 3D model with other systems and databases. Uh, in doing so, what we do is we don't copy data from other systems. We leave the data where it sits and where it belongs, but you make it accessible through the digital twin in a very intuitive way. Just give me, give, let me give you one other example. Um, if you imagine um, a building uh, management system, which has lots of sensors and rooms and uh, sensor data, and they all appear to the facility manager as a long list of rooms and sensors, 
maybe a dashboard. So from the dashboard, you can tell um, there is a room with a certain number and now in the room, there's a certain temperature and humidity and whatever there is. So that's all data. Now let's say there is an alert because the temperature has gone up uh, to a concerning value and the alarm goes off. So the facility manager then has to make a decision. Now we're back to decision-making. Um, how do, what, what do you decide? You're, you're not on site. You can't just go upstairs and walk into the room, but you have to make a decision. Do you evacuate the building or the room or the floor? Um, with the dashboard, it's quite hard. Just imagine you have the same information in a three-dimensional context. So you have a virtual room and you see all the temperature, the humidity, et cetera. You have a papal sensor. You see there is no person in the room at the moment. What you can also do in the 3D model, you can walk out go into the room next door and just check in the virtual model, are people sitting in the room next door and on the other side? How many people are there in total? You can also see if there any critical infrastructure or technical rooms or what else is around there. So it's a lot more information and it's in a much more um, intuitive and, and accessible way for the human brain to process the data to come to a better decision. And that's exactly what our 3D models do. They give you a better understanding of the information that would otherwise be locked into lists or spreadsheets or values but the human brain can't process that quickly. So Ilka, thank you very much for sharing that vision with us and that strategy. You're working on that platform to make that data accessible, uh, to change the way we work, we live, we think in companies and associations. And um, I think you also have a good picture for that. Yes, I do. And that is really, this is our vision for the platform that we are creating. Just imagine that in a few years, um, someone um, working in asset management will say to his colleague, her colleague, can you imagine um, we were running all the, the whole estate and all these technical assets here simply on technical places and long lists and spreadsheets. And that person then says, Oh, yes, you're right. We didn't have 3D models at the time. Oh, I can't even imagine how we worked back then, but actually it's not that long ago. And then the other person says, you know, what? I can't even imagine uh, to do my job without the digital twin hub. And someone else says, no, no way. That's, you can't imagine that. So this is our vision that this conversation happens, say, in three years from now. Okay, thank you very much. So Ilka, in conclusion, what do we need to integrate that vision of working with digital twins more and more as tools in our real world? Well, okay, you could just come to us and uh, we will let it, we'll do it for you and you become a, a customer and a client on the digital twin hub on our platform. But I think it's a lot, um, the basics is really um, that people start to understand the value of the data they've got and start unlocking that by giving it, giving more people access to it in a secure, safe way, obviously, but also maybe really giving giving the data that understandable and intuitive interface that the 3D model can provide. Mm. That would be my vision. Thanks for that vision. And I see we have arrived at the commercial break. So head over to Lock Lab, as Ilka just mentioned, and uh, join uh, that digital twin hub. Yeah, of course, we will do. Thanks for fascinating us too about the work you do and your ideas um, about digital twins and what they can do. Um, yeah, this is so interesting to share the thoughts about the applications and how they change the world we live to, we think we work. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here as an expert and I uh, hope to see you in Essen, Ilka, this year. We can meet in presence. You will, for sure. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, Denise. Ilka, bye. <laughs>